So excited to see you here for the special 20th anniversary milestone of the Ubud Writers and Readers Festival. Maddie's gone through the housekeeping, so that's great. I don't need to do that anymore. Um, but yeah, I might just introduce the speakers with their bios. I mean, you've read the bios, but I'll give you like a little condensed version just so that you are aware. Um, to my immediate left, this is disgusting because Brody's actually my bestie, but <laughs> hashtag no nepotism. Um, Brody, where is it? I edited his bio as well because I know him intimately. Um, Brody Comedy is an Australian poet and journalist. He has published two collections of poetry, Flat Exit in 2017 and Shouldering Pine in 2023. His poetry has also appeared in literary journals such as Mianjin, Cordite, and Voice Works. Um, next on left, again, um, Virginia Helzanka is a co-founder of Unspoken Bali Poetry Slam, which heads up has, uh, is co-presenting an event tonight, which features me as a special guest. Um, <laughs> also, Norman is a judge. Hashtag no nepotism. <laughs> um, where are my notes? Virginia is associated with the Queer Language Club, having presented Speak the Unspoken, a queer poetry reading in 2021. Her poetry collection, Cocktail, Waves, and Archer, was published in 2017. We have Christy, who in 2022 was named the 13th New Zealand Poet Laureate. His debut collection, How to Be Dead in a Year of Snakes, was a finalist in the poetry category at the 2016 Ockham New Zealand Book Awards. And his latest collection is Super Model Minority. And of course, the inimitable Norman Erickson Pasaribu, whose poetry collection, Sergius Mankari Bacchus, won the first prize of Jakarta Arts Council's Poetry Manuscripts Competition in 2015. Their short story collection, um, Happy Stories, mostly, won the UK's Republic of Consciousness Prize in 2022. Exciting. Okay. Oh my God, you're all so clappy. I love it. Clap, clap, clap. Um, so just a bit of a, are we on time? Yeah. Um, just a bit of a summary for you. Um, today we'll be talking about queerness, of course. Um, but we won't just be talking about concepts, the concept of queerness, but also the people behind them, obviously, and how they um, interrelate, how their works interrelate with society, how everything intermingles. Um, something I'm very passionate about whenever I moderate conversations, and I've moderated many a conversation, which is why I'm so good at it, is that I actually despise conversations about identity by itself. And so what we'll do is um, adopt an intersectional approach. What does that mean? Um, that means that we will integrate conversations about queerness, we have conversations about gender, conversations about ability and neurodiversity, basically all of the other identity labels that we're you know, talking about now, especially in the zeitgeist. Um, yeah, I've structured the conversation into four sections interspersed with readings in between because I found that audiences uh, enjoy having a concrete reference point. So you get a taster of their work and then you have to buy their books at Perry Plus so you can read more of it. Um, if you've been to any event that I've moderated, and now you will look me up, I have a website at jolfaranhuez.com. Um, you will find out that I'm very, very good at structuring things. In this context, we have four sections, all starting with S, because alliteration <laughs> is essential to poetry. Um, we have stipulations, where we talk about broad-based definitions. We'll talk about sources, so inspiration, where we get material from. We'll do style, the way that we turn raw material into masterpieces, and then we'll talk about society, by which I mean the impact of all this art that we're creating. And then we'll open up the floor. Do not try to talk. It's a question uh, forum, not a, I wanted to be a panelist, and so I'm going to talk as well. I will cut you off because we have a timer. <laughs> Are we all good? Are we all ready? You love me. You love the poets as well. Sorry, this isn't about me, lol. <laughs> all right. In that spirit, um, Norman, we might start with a reading from yeah. you, please, to set the scene. Uh, Two minutes. So I'm going to read a poem, like, a dinner poem between a, a niece and the aunt talking about hetero people because hetero people no longer exist. Posh hat. Auntie, what kind of food did hetero people like? I mean, they look exactly like us, as magnificent as us. I saw their photos and statues in the museum last week, right after the dinosaurs. The guide laughed when I asked if they like frozen strawberry jam on their bread. I like a frost straw on my bread, just have your eye. I don't know, it gives me hope. Why did so many of them run with a backpack on? 
It's as if they perpetually just came out of the train station. So late for a job interview. I mean, the job interview. It's understandable. Maybe hetero people were poor and had a family to feed. Were some of them rich though? Did they have to always work overtime? Any of them doing accounting like you? Was it easy for them to get a job? Also, when hetero people lost their job, did they cry? When they cried, did they think of their moms? I mean, the younger version of their moms. I mean, the version of their moms when they still had the jobs. I mean, the moms who still had bright futures. I mean, the sandwich generation. Auntie, should we write a poem right now for all the hetero people who lost their job? For all the hetero people who cried alone on the train platform at night, too afraid to go home, all they could think was jamless bread. I'll write them for, for them sandwiches, of course, but I also want to make flowers bloom out of them. I don't know. Anything floral gives me life. Do you think they would appreciate this gesture? Did they ever get mad about something? Oh well. No one despises flower, obviously, unless you have an allergy. I wonder now whether hetero people ever had an allergy to something that they decided to kill. Auntie, were some of the murderers? It's quite wild to think so though. They look exactly like us, as beautiful, as magnificent as us. Honestly, I don't want to think about it. I pray for a blue planet full of living beings. But if some of them are here and want us dead and we tell them to leave us alone, will they? Thanks so much, Norman. On that note, as for stipulations, let's begin by setting the terms, I guess, of our discussion. When we talk about queerness, what exactly are we talking about? And so at least from the Western perspective, you know, queer is a noun, queer is a verb, queer is an adjective. You know, it means so many things. It's all encompassing. We talk about the identity label, you know, queer as a style, queer as, an, uh, as a verb. It's also about challenging conventions or reading against the grain. So many things. Um, but Norman and Virginia, as Indonesians in particular, I'd like to ask you first, um, would you say that as Indonesians, the discourse or the politics around queerness and LGBTQIA plus people unfolds differently or, or kind of manifests in a different way than in perhaps, you know, the first world or Western context that the rest of us are familiar with? Uh, for me personally, it will be different because pre-colonial Indonesia is known to be more queer than after the colonial. So when we talk about uh, contemporary queer, I think for me personally, it has to be uh, discussed in a post-colonial with a lens. So it's kind of like quite complicated. And then when we talk about uh, the queer lives in Indonesia, and when we talk, and then we talk it in the, the post-colonial lens, we also talk about the Western queer theories that not, I mean, the gender diversities in Indonesia might not go with the Western theories about queer. Virginia? Yes. Um. Hello. Um, adding to that, uh, politically and socially, it's two different worlds. Um, mm. For political, what we what it is now, um, it's definitely something that it's more of a uh, ham, yeah, hak asasi manusia daripada specifically ke queerness uh, or apa hak asasi manusia. Uh, so in here, we have to brand queer rights as human rights. Yeah. Because if we use the word queer, people would hate it. Yeah, and then for the socially, to be honest, um, it depends on where you are. Um, Bali is we're, we're pretty privileged. Uh, we're pretty, uh, it's all pretty open-minded, um, but in other places, not so much. And also, class. I mean, when I when I talk when I talk about social class, it's more about economical class. It also makes a difference. Um, higher, so, uh, higher social and economic class would be more uh, open for conversation and normalizing uh, queerness than the lower class, yeah. This idea of humanizing certainly rings true for us. And if we kind of 
um, plot the trajectory of gay rights, um, or just now queer rights in general, certainly in the Western context, this idea of love is love was something that was quite necessary. Um, if you look up Archer Magazine, which is a mag an LGBTQA plus magazine that I edited years ago, um, that, was, that was kind of the focal point was this difference between the ways that we talk about universalizing, which in a way kind of flattens the specificities, the specific uh, constraints and difficulties that we have as queer people, um, versus you know juggling that with the need to present us as we are the same as you, which builds a kind of forces and empathy. Mm. Um, but so Brody and Chris, as citizens of so-called first world countries, where on this trajectory we've in theory moved past we are the same as you, to we have different needs, different interests, um, but we coexist with you. Um, yeah, what is it like to be queer? <laughs> so in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, homosexuality was decriminalized in 1986. So that's still within my own lifetime. So I wasn't old enough to remember it, but um, it just reinforces how recent it actually is, um, that it's still you know, very recent history. And I remember very clearly the uh, civil union debates of the mid noughties and then the same-sex marriage legislation in New Zealand in 2013, I think it was. Oh, 2014. And what we've seen is the same sort of rhetoric and arguments and debates about those particular uh, pivotal moments in, in our queer history are being dragged up again in 2023 um, with the trans rights um, issues and um, the activism around that. And for me, it sort of reinforces how there's still so much more to do to combat a lot of those thoughts and feelings from, you know, in, in the general population. Um, I've always been quite uh, conflicted with that whole it gets better phrase and terminology that got thrown around quite a bit in the um, late noughties, early teens, uh, as a way to sort of, yeah, you know, bridge the two worlds. And I, 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 some days I don't think it gets better. Some days I think it gets worse because we haven't actually you know, moved beyond a lot of that very basic human rights, human decency. Let's not talk about these people as if they're monsters and pedophiles and, and people that don't deserve the same rights as everyone else. Um, the context in Australia is quite similar to Aotearoa in New Zealand. Um, the only thing I would say from the historical perspective is that uh, because Australia is a federation of different states, different states decriminalised uh, homosexuality at different times. And the last one most recently within my lifetime, you know, I turned 30 this year and Tasmania only decriminalised homosexuality in the 90s. So it's um, different in different parts of Australia, just as I'm sure it is in New Zealand. And, yeah, I can only just reinforce uh, that, yeah, we're having similar conversations to what we did 20 years ago about our trans um, siblings. Yeah. And so moving from queerness as a kind of amorphous abstract concept to queer poetry, which is the theme of this talk that we're having, um, just like short kind of 10, 15 second descriptions, what then is queer poetry to you? And we'll go in this order. This order? Yeah, you go first. Ooh. Um, Pressure. How many words was it again? <laughs> 15 seconds. Try to keep us on time. Mm. Queer poetry for me isn't just about the people, uh, poetry about the sex, the, the sex that we have with people. It's about disruption. Mm. Um, it's more of us, uh, I would say, from me and my perspective of self-declaration and um, claiming truth. Yep. yep, I totally agree with both of those. And for me, it's about imagining possibilities. Uh, for me, it's about anger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah, it's important. Love that. Well, speaking of queer poetry, Virginia, would you like to regale us with a reading for two minutes plus? Okay. Um, so this is not my poetry. Uh, I'm going to take you guys to the 1980s. Um, there was, uh, there used to be Indonesian queer magazine or queer zine now, people call it. Um, it's an underground movement with uh, queer communities. Uh, well, the 
I'm gonna try to read it in English, but the actual poetry is in um, Indonesian. Uh, you can access all of this. Uh, there is a huge archival movement at the moment uh, online. You can look it up, Queer, Arca Queer Indonesian, Indonesian Archive. archive. Uh, and there are short stories and poetry from back then in the 80s. Yeah. Wishful thinking. The first time I saw you this morning, I felt that my heart was burning. I knew the attraction was purely physical. But I hope the feeling was mutual. As you sat in front of me in the class, I was tempted to make a pass. But I was afraid you would misunderstand, so I decided to make another plan. I wish you knew my real intention, so I don't have to send you an invitation. I realize this might be a wishful thinking, but at this point, it's better than doing nothing. I've been dreaming there would be someone like you, my life has been empty and colorless, but you came into my life like a dream come true. Together we might enjoy the happiness. Maybe one day soon I could have you. I can't wait for the things we'll do. I hope you'll take me as your man, because I don't want it to be just a one night stand. Maybe one day soon we could be together, although I'm sure that couldn't be forever. I honestly think it doesn't really matter as long as we try to please each other. MBS. 1983. Mm. On one hand, Virginia, I appreciate that you followed the time perfectly, so thank you. Um, but I will also say that it is very queer to disobey or transgress the moderator's instructions, which is fine, we accept. And also, secondly, to live translate, that's also very queer. It's almost like queer is just about, yeah, anger and challenging and resistance. <laughs> Um, we're moving to the second S, sources. Um, where do our stories come from, I guess is kind of the question that I'm asking here. Um, in one of your poems, Chris, you write, inside every poem is a mirror. Mm. Um, Virginia, in one of yours, you say, I couldn't feel the home when I'm back home. So I guess I'm really, in really interested in the ways that your poems tackle each of you, the relationship between person and place. Um, and maybe, Chris, we start with you, given the first quote that I quoted was from you. Mm. Um, your collection's title suggests um, or it sh that it channels your experiences as a racialized queer person um, in a largely Anglo-Saxon country. Would you say that your work is an attempt to yeah, critique or challenge mm. or disrupt these political structures? Yeah, so when I first started writing, I was very much focused on my Chinese New Zealand identity because I was still in the closet and keeping a lot of that to myself, trying to figure out what that meant. So I never actually wrote about being gay until much later into my 20s. Um, and I think for me, poetry was that outlet to explore and understand why is it I'm feeling this way? Why am I scared about this? What will happen if I tell people? And so I wrote a lot of that poetry for myself. And then when I did come out, I thought, okay, maybe it's time to, to put this out into the world. So for me, poetry has always been that uh, channel to explore and understand. And I remember putting my second book out, He So Mask, which is very much about that journey and that, that exploration of um, Chinese New Zealand identity and gay identity and how the two mesh together. Especially coming from a, a Chinese New Zealand family where my parents didn't really know any queer people and didn't know anyone with queer children. So for them, they had no frame of reference of what it means to be gay or queer a contemporary Aotearoa New Zealand society and held on to a lot of cliches and stereotypes about what it, what it must mean. And so for me, a lot of my writing at that, at that time was sort of unpicking that and sort of trying to show that it's not easy to reconcile the two sides, that actually there's a lot of tension between the two. And then, yeah, for Supermodel Minority, it was about that still, but then figuring out how that fits within broader New Zealand society global politics, um, how those two sides of me can sometimes disagree about the same issues or the same things, and then sort of figuring out well, why is that. Um, so yeah, so Supermodel Minority, I think the title is a, just a little wee joke, um, but it, yeah, it, it has that, um, what we call a kaupapa of, of understanding intersectionality and rallying against um, colonial structures and uh, heteronormativity, sort of 
how do we actually, as queer people and as POC, challenge those frameworks every day? I love this idea of reconciling yeah, facets or, or phases of our personalities. It reminds me of an interview um, that we published on Liminal magazine, you can look it up, uh, with William Yang, who is, you know, mm elder Gaijin of Australia, photographer, um, and he talked about the way that he came out as Asian later than he came out as gay. And that's kind of this idea of we come out or we, we come to terms with different facets of our identities at different times. Um, Norman, several of your poems touch on death, regret, conversion therapy, um, but also kind of beautiful things like stolen glances and sneaky romantic encounters. Can you talk us through these various stories? <laughs> So actually this, that book that you mentioned is kind of like old book. <laughs> so uh, it was written in like 2015 and it won a national prize in a Jakarta Art Council. Anyway, brilliant title. <laughs> and then uh, I wrote it as a personal, just I feel like I'm a very angry teen and I just, I need to be angry, so those books is just like my anger and my tears, just just that, honestly. I don't, well, I'm a nerd, so I read a lot of books. So yeah, just that, mm -hmm. anger and nerdy stuff. So with that in mind, would you say that the short story collection, which is titled Happy Stories Mostly, is a way to kind of remedy the no, anger? No, it's kind no. of, I'm still angry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, Virginia, your poems depict the gendered pressures placed by society on women and girls. So body image, beauty, femininity. What made you decide to, you know, tackle these topics? Right, because basically I don't have that much friends that I can trust with all of my thoughts. But uh, sometimes it might be, t well, I grow up, just to give a context, I grew up within a Muslim um, family that they're not very strict, but they are really following the rules. So any anything uh, differ from everyone believes is something that I'm afraid to speak out loud. Even as simple as uh, wearing pants instead of wearing skirts. Um, and then uh, as simple as uh, I don't wanna um, wear makeup all the time to, because like it's just, you, you have to at least uh, powder or something. So it's literally a way for me to look for a friend. Um, I write it like a, it's a diary, but I never really good writing prose, it never finished. So uh, kind of becomes poetry on its own way. And also for me to release anger, <laughs> Definitely, we are all angry here. Um, yeah, it's a, a, a way to, for me to look for a friend. And I think at that time, also, it got to one point when I got really sad, really low, and uh, thinking of uh, ending life and all of that. And that really writing is just helps in a way. Uh, yes, I, I can maybe talk to someone in the book that I'm writing for. Um, and I just, and then sometimes when I finish, I would just wish someone ha had done it for me in a way. Mm. So, yeah. That's a beautiful idea of speaking to someone else or speaking to perhaps even your past self. Um, and Brody, your poetry distills the tension between urban and rural, or perhaps the dislocation between uh, feeling like a settler, or the dislocation felt there being a settler, yeah, on stolen land, um, indigenous land. How does queerness feed into that? Mm, good question. <laughs> mm, I think it feeds into it by being within but also on the edge, maybe, looking in. Um, so to use a concrete example, uh, I'm from a town about three hours drive northeast of Melbourne and that is unceded Dudaroa country and I am not First Nations. Uh, uh, but it, it, it's a place that is home. I've lived in Melbourne for 12 years now and home is not my little apartment <laughs> in the bustling city. Home is where I grew up. But at the same time, um, it's important to 
uh, yeah, uh, acknowledge that uh, it's, yeah, that's also not, uh, yeah, my thing to speak about. And so, yeah, that's sort of what I would say is being liminal, you know, being part of, you know, masculinity, but sort of not the traditional um, concept, heteronormative concept of masculinity, yeah. Love, love, love. This reminds me of two um, lines from two different poets. Adrian Reich, she talks about the way that poetry is a way to face the underside of everything you've loved, so to challenge things that are familiar. And then Seamus Haney talks about the way that poetry is kind of has this pro prophetic quality to redress the ills of the world. Both things, all kind of resonant with all of the works that you've done. Um, to transition to our next phase, Brody, would you like to share us, share something for us, please? Sure. Um, this is just a little segment from uh, my latest book, Shouldering Pine. I'm not sure how much time we have left on this spinning rock in the sky, I think, as a great gum reaches for Orion's belt. Just because a place is beautiful doesn't mean you won't slip down an abandoned mine shaft. We're all panning for specks of something. A friend's tarot cards describe the road I must take. I explain a raw chestnut tastes like carrot. We walk to the Airbnb under a warm lick of rain. In a way, we are all mountains emptying ourselves into rivers, emptying into the ocean. Sadness always manages to hammer out a new shape. Whenever I sit down into soil, part of me doesn't want to sit back up. Plow shallow and you get a worthless crop. Not a symmetry of trees in clear, straight lines. What's the point if a fox is going to come home anyway? A hairbrush snapping in two across the back of my skull. There is a word for across the other side of the river. It isn't my place to tell you. If you're lucky, a phone tower won't block your view. Is that moss or a bruise? It's hard to tell if the space between us is getting larger or it's just the universe expanding. There's a reason I won't let you touch my throat with both hands. Okay, we're up to style. Um, the way we transform the raw material of life into beautiful, magnificent poetry. Um, Birdie, we might stick with you just because we've just heard your poetry so we can kind of dissect it, which is one of my favorite um, activities. Yeah, so queer poetry very easily devolves into sentimentality, or at least from my experience, as someone who has judged literary prizes. Um, sometimes that is the trap that queer poetry falls into, overly sentimentalizing, or it becomes overly dramatic, talking about grief, talking about loss, you know, things that are very familiar to queer people, um, but also quite boring in a way because of the, the oversaturation that we've experienced with them. So I'd love to talk about technique, imagery, style, all that stuff. Brody, in your poetry, you expertly blend yeah, images of nature, domesticity, eroticism, memory as well, while playing with <laughs> line breaks, enjambment, multiple interpretations. Um, can you talk us through your process of writing poetry, making beautiful poetry? Ooh, the literal process? The... Yeah, just like quickly, don't bore us, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I get up in the morning and I have a batch of, no, no. Get out. Um, <laughs> yeah, please. Um, okay, how do I? Uh, TLDR this. So for me, poetry is all about concision. And for me, poetry is almost like, I was chatting to someone about this last night actually, but it's almost like pre or post language through language. And so my process involves um, a lot of hectic scribbles and iPhone notes. But because for me, poetry is about concision, it's all about pairing, pairing, pairing. Uh, pairing it back um, and so uh, something that I always do is go back over cut unnecessary um, conjugations or words you know little words um, and in terms of line breaks um, I, I think if you're going to use line breaks they should be useful right um, and and serve a purpose and so in um, Shouldering Pine a key theme is breathlessness um, because a lot of the book is about anxiety and grief and panic attacks. And so I use um, the enjambment in a way that sort of cuts, um, 
you know, like an adjective will finish one line, but the noun will come next. So it sort of forces the reader to um, have just, you know, half a second of anticipation um, just to try and reinforce what I'm going for. So I guess if you're asking about process, it's basically as much editing as, as writing to try and get um, to what I'm trying to say. Mm. Mm. And so moving from deliberately, you know, plotted out line breaks and, and capturing breathlessness. Virginia, there's a conversational quality to your poetry, in particular in Cocktail Waves and Archer. It's actually been described as being, in a review, as being like uh, akin to a chat between friends while sitting, while sipping cocktails on the beach, we love. Um, how did you manage to evoke this, um, I would describe it as radically intimate, this radically intimate way of, of telling stories? Um, when I, I never really sit down on writing a piece and stick to it to what I intended it to be. It's always a part here, a part there, and sometimes it becomes a poetry that, that are completely different from what I, when I started it. Um, in, in a flow, it's always been like a conversation. And like I said, I write it because uh, I feel like um, talking to someone so it's always, there's a bit of conversational uh, tone in all of my poems, either on a, from the third uh, person point of view or from the first person point of view. And like, uh, like you as well, I would put in iPhone notes and so, uh, sorry, I don't have iPhone, my phone is Android. Well, I don't know why I said that. Not, not <laughs> sponsored by iPhone, not sponsored. <laughs> on a phone phone Sponsor us actually, give us money. <laughs> Phone memos, uh, even sometimes uh, whenever I feel like it, even on a, on a piece of uh, tissue somewhere, I just need to write it down. And so I just write it down there and take a photo of it and put it, uh, continue it later. Um, yes, yeah, so radically intimate. Thank you for using the term. I like it. Mm, she's a critic. <laughs> <laughs> it's because, uh, because um, I want to... Uh, let it out. It's why I write. I write. Uh, I write because I want to uh, release um, the usually all of the frustration, anger, sadness that I have. All of my poems kind of depressing in a way. I only have one love poem. All of the, the others are either anger or depressed and sad. So yeah. <laughs> And so, Norman, I am going back to the, the poetry collection, sorry, only because um, we're talking about poetic form and style. Um, so that poetry collection is full of Christian and biblical imagery, which is a way, I guess, to perhaps, you know, offset the quite personal or radically intimate nature of the subject matter. Um, your, your collection's title or that collection's title references to historical figures who have been queered. You know, that's, that it's not official that they're queer, but some of us like to read into them as queer. What for you is the relationship between so-called official, um, but also these queered accounts of history, including your own? I got a lot of questions why I put two Arabic Christian sons into the title of my books, and I'm a Tababatak person. And then I, my answer is, as a queer person, I get demonized all the time since I was very small. So I also want to get to be saints. I also want to be celebrated, humanly venerated, something like that. And then I feel like this, that is a really good way to respond to the queerphobia that me and my friends have been enduring our whole lives. And then we often, we often be called like the sign of apocalypse somehow. And then I also want to say that we are also children of God, even though I don't think I believe in God. So, yeah, I believe in my ancestors. So I feel like uh, that is a good way to respond to the the structure. But somehow, sometimes some people think that I'm religious, which is you can think whatever you want. And then I think, uh, yeah, I think I think it's it, about the formal and non-formal. I think, of course, uh, I, when you talk about speculative fiction, it's a really good way. So, I mean, of course, as a as a first as a queer, when I try to to write a queer poetry, my first step is to reject. So, if a if a white priest said that my people 
uh, are cannibals. My first response is, I'm saying no to what you said. So if people said that queer is a sign of apocalypse, I'm going to say no. So that's the first part, for, the first step of uh, writing for me, saying no to all of these sounds around me. And then after that, you are going to make your own gospels. You are going to make your own poems. You are going to make your own Xiaomi notes. <laughs> yeah, iPhone notes. I, yeah. You know what I mean. This, and then, yeah, I think after this, you can, after you, because I feel like you can always revise the world. You can always rewrite the world. I mean, white anthropologists made a version about my ancestors, so I'm going to respond to them and then made my own version. I think that's the only way to do things. Yeah. Love that idea. Um, and so, Chris, ending this section, um, your, your collection plays with form, tone, voice, um, and we were talking about this earlier. I feel like it's a very antipodean, very Australian and New Zealand kind of way to challenge authority through you know, deadpan or a kind of a more subdued tone. Um, what do you think is achieved by this, you know, mishmash of, on one hand, playfulness, mm -hmm. and then on the other hand, kind of restraint or, or you know, consistency? Yeah. I, so my very first book was um, a book link sequence about a hate crime that took place in Wellington. And for a couple of years when I was promoting that book, I realized I was getting up and talking and reading poetry about a murder and a hate crime for like 10, 15 minutes. And I'm very proud of that book, but it's quite depressing <laughs> to, to get up and promote, you know, constantly. So I made a very conscious decision for my second book to, to have a little bit of fun, to be playful, to try and insert those moments of joy alongside that unpicking of queerness and, you know, all that anxiety and the stress. Um, and then, yeah, for Sumo Minority, it was very much about how do I take that even further. So sometimes a lot of my poems will just start off as a dumb joke and then spiral out of control and into something that hopefully is a bit more meaningful and earnest. Um, I think that's my way of approaching a lot of these issues. And for me, that book was very much a, a conscious attempt to, to claim space. So there are a lot of um, prose poems in that book which take up the entire page. And I made that a very deliberate thing because I wanted people to be confronted with this dense block of text to have that feeling of what it's like sometimes to be a queer person or a queer person of color in the world being bombarded and being confronted with everything that happens on a daily basis. So not only was it a, a literal attempt to claim space on the page, it was uh, an attempt to sort of project, this is what it feels like sometimes. And yeah, I, I, I definitely like to joke around because that's like the Kiwi way. Like um, someone asked me, at a, an event um, in the UK a few weeks ago, like, oh, you know, I want to write about climate change, but I also use a lot of humor. Is it okay to combine climate change, a serious topic, pressing topic with humor? And I said, yeah, because, you know, sometimes humor is that way in to a very difficult topic that um, people want to talk about and want to think about, but, you know, the relentless, you know, doom scrolling can often turn people off, right? Because they just had too much of it. But if you bring a bit of humor into it, you sort of, do, you open up the conversation a lot more. You open it up to different ways of looking at it. Yeah, certainly humor is an empathy generator. And studies have found that tapping into the emotions is much more powerful in terms of convincing people rather than cold hard logic or rather than just enumerating all of the ills and apocalyptic events of the world. So absolutely. On that note, please, would you like to regale us sure with thing. a reading? Um, I'm gonna read a poem called White Flag, which uh, was inspired by an artwork by a queer New Zealand artist called Grant Lingard. And Grant um, stitched together a whole bunch of white jockey wife fronts to make a flag. And for me, it was quite important in this collection to refer to or write poems inspired by queer and uh, Asian artists as a way of acknowledging that lineage and acknowledging people that have come uh, before me. So this is called White Flag. I surrender my body to all histories, the visible and the vanished, piercing through the afterglow of erotic waste like holes in the tight shirts I used to wear to attract older men. Now they only attract moths, light drunk and in search of keratin. That was me before I knew how to recognize my own hand punching every wall in my path, skin perforated and refusing to hold any shape, at least the ones I considered desirable. I craved the color black to contain me, 
I shunned white because it reveals too much when you're considered dirty. A needle pulling thread doesn't always leave a stitch. Very deep on a VHS tape in our TV cabinet was a 90s hunk in red tartan boxer shorts, seduced by one of his teachers. I coveted those shorts so I would know what it might feel like to be desired. It didn't work, nor did the jock straps or the tank tops or the faux snakeskin pants all worn for show and to tell, ultimately, nothing. Fortune's fool learns to simmer in vain, correcting their course with one bloodied and bruised hand. I know this is my body. I know this is my refuge. I know sometimes I must take away its privacy to make amends with what I was afraid to deem plain or ornamental. Thanks, Chris. Now, we were going to move into the final section called Society, but I'm conscious of time. So what we'll do is we'll hand over to you the society of this, converse, of this, uh, of this event. Um, I was going to ask about destigmatization and envisioning futures, but um, perhaps I'll open the floor to you first. And if there are no questions, which is unlikely, but if there aren't any questions, I get to ask my questions. Yes, you were first, please. How do we do this? Oh, there's a mic coming. Yeah. Love your talk. <laughs> I'd like to know um, what writing tools do you use in your poetry to express the LGBTQ community? For example, like um, metaphors, oxymorons, similes, yeah. I use a lot of pop culture references um, as, my, as my touch points. Um, I remember being given poetry as a teenager at high school and not and feeling like a failure because I couldn't understand all of the historical literary references in it. And so for me, it's quite important to make poetry as accessible as possible. And I reference Carly Rae Jepsen, Kylie Minogue, Madonna, all of these really important pop stars who have shaped um, my, my experiences as, as a young queer person. And I think that is my way of saying, hey, K people, read my poems and this is what it's all about. <laughs> Hey Kylie. Hey Kylie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just quickly, um, the tool that I probably use the most, particularly early on in my poetry, is like an expansive U, like an addressee um, that is shifting and queer and changes between romantic and platonic. And the reason I did that was growing up in Australia and in regional Australia especially, a lot of the texts, poetry texts that we learnt were, you know, Shakespeare or, you know, very like old, dead, white, straight guys. And they were always talking about a you who was like a, you know, beloved woman, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so for me, it's important to um, show that, uh, I mean, yeah, obviously the you can be someone of the same gender or a minority gender, but it could also be um, uh, your friends because, you know, friendship, your found family is so important to LGBTIQ plus people when, you know, sometimes you're cast off from your family or... Um, yeah, even your friends that you grew up with. So, yeah, that's a tool that I would use is a expansive you, a shifting you. Yeah. I made a lot of parody. I mean, you hetero people are so funny. So you need to be the butt of the joke all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rihanna, sometimes I feel a little bit... Uh, guilty about it because every time I write poetry it's less imaginary than what you expect a poem do, uh, poetry would be. Um, uh, probably the uh, tools, language, language, what would you call this thing? Metaphorical tools that I probably use a lot is simile, definitely, because um, I'm more straight to the point and a bit less lyrical. Um, but I'm more... Uh, thinking about the flow of the story, um, yeah, within the poetry. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the structural of it is what I'm more concerned mm -hmm. more. I mean, the fantastic thing about poetry is that it's, you know, esoteric, it's, it's omnivorous, it kind of takes in a lot of things. What I think distinguishes excellent poetry is the level of deliberation, the level of contemplation that's put into the selection of styles, imageries, topics, rhythms. So, yeah. Questions? <gasps> Queer poet with the pink jar. Oh no, can you stand up? Can you just yeah, do can a you little please? twirl? This is the, yeah. this is this the is event is. today, everybody. 
Yes. We, we can there's a mic over there, though. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, there's a mic behind you. We're going to get matching love, love, ones love. of that, I yeah. think. Yeah. yeah. Not working. Yeah. I was wondering for all of you, um, what are your ambitions? Like, if you would dream very big in five or ten years, what would you reach with your poetry? If at least a few of you could mm. tell me. Before you answer that, I'm just going to say that this dovetails perfectly to one of my questions, which is the idea of, you know, queer futures. Um, Jose Esteban Munoz writes about queer futurity. Jack Halberstam talks about the queer art of failure, which is a wordplay because failure is quite, you know, a hetero concept. Like, we're all kind of open to failing and developing through failing, growing through failing. Anyway, please answer the question. Thanks. <laughs> no, you're first. Oh. Um, so, as Poet Laureate, a lot of what I've been doing in the past year and a half is to uh, promote poetry and to advocate for poetry and try to inspire um, people from all walks of life to engage with poetry. And I think, for me, that will always be the mission. I just want to keep trying to make poetry accessible and exciting and to basically introduce people to as many different types of poets and poetry as possible. Um, I have always felt that there's a poem or a poet out there for someone, uh, for, for everyone. And yeah, it just might take time to find that, that poet or that poem, but um, I want people to, to, to discover the joys of poetry. Uh, I think as a queer, I want, uh, I am, I want to, for me and my friends, to be celebrated uh, without, like, without thinking if we are successful or not. Like, when we are like just ordinary people, we are also embraced and celebrated. And as a writer, I think I want to feel in Bali. So buy my books, make me rich, so I can <laughs> live rich. <laughs> Pardon? That's the question, right? Where is the you book? You should email the first of all why Norman Erickson Pasaribus books are not available, blah, 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 blah. Do it for me. Startachange.org, thank you. <laughs> OK. Um, uh, personally, uh, for my work specifically, I just really wish it to be passed around for mm -hmm. other um, Muslim queer women. Um, to just let them know that they're not alone and that, and that it's not something weird, things like that. And um, um, if they need a friend, then they can reach out, things like that. It's not, um, I don't really have a big ambition for my own work, but uh, for poetry itself, I do have big ambitions to create a space for like Poetry Slam and what Poetry Slam Effect can do. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to create a wadah, yeah. A room, uh, I want to, a platform, platform uh, for uh, people to write and express it um, at, and also have an audience uh, give a feedback to it. And that's uh, what I'm doing with the Unspoken Bali Poetry Slam right now. I want it to be uh, not only to specific class of um, people, but uh, to everyone, local, all Indonesians, um, all around Bali, all over Indonesia. And I hope to take these people that are, that are joining into the movement to other, uh, making like yeah. um, exchanges to other, in other country, in, in Singapore, in Australia. So that's, uh, if you want to call, uh, um, if you're, because you're asking about ambition, that's the ambition. <laughs> Still going, but yeah, not there yet. That's really beautiful. Um, yeah, maybe people have already said this or hinted at it, but my ambition would be uh, to be superseded for someone someone to sort of, in the same way that the text that I read growing up, for someone to come along, whether it's um, a young trans girl or a First Nations writer, to read my book and go, oh, I can do that and I can do that better. Yeah. Love, love, love. We only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to close um, with a final kind of task for you. Um, Norman, I quote you here, you say, an individual's path to happiness is coextensive with the paths of others. Birdie, you say, it's so much easier to love someone over yourself. Do you have any final parting words for us, um, for especially for the queer community or for any kind of emerging poets before we close this event? Hire queer, hire poets, if you have, if you own like workplace. Yeah. Um, be hot, go to therapy. Yeah. 
<laughs> we all have traumas. <laughs> Makes sense. Cuts out. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. riffing off what Brody's <laughs> previous answer, not that one, but that one's a good, that's good <laughs> advice. Um, keep writing and keep doing it the way you want to do it. There's no set path or template to be a queer poet or even a poet. Um, it's looking at the past and seeing what's happened and then challenge, con continually challenge, challenging that and creating your version of the world or your version of poetry. And I would say reach out to your local queer communities. Um, Sometimes, if you're, even if you're, especially for those um, uh, queer newbies, is that a thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, reach out to, hang out even sometimes. There's like so many queer kinds of community. This is like a movie club. Is it like a reading club? If it's something, it's just a hangout club. Like it's so many different kinds of uh, mm -hmm. queer communities. And so like um, hang out and then like it don't, don't feel like it singles out. Uh, within the community, because there's so many out there now. Yeah, Amazing. We're hot, but we're not scary. I think that's the takeaway <laughs> from that piece of advice. A little Maybe bit scary. I, I know little I'm bit a scary. little bit, but that's okay. <laughs> um, well, on that note, we might wrap up the panel. We're very, very on time, because I'm excellent. So are you as well. So are all of you. <laughs> babes, everybody. Everyone's a babe. Um, I need to thank specific people. Thank you so much to the Ubud Writers Festival, of course, for having us. Um, again, the festival continues for the rest of today and tomorrow. Um, if you don't know what is on, head to ubudwritersfestival.com. Thank you to Yayasan Mudra Swari Saraswati Patrons Program and to all of the festival patrons. Um, and that's it. Please join me in thanking the speakers and thanks to all of you. Have a great day. Thank you.